and welcome everybody to this webinar about software risk management. I almost feel like a rock star after the presentation made by Carl, but I will try to not disappoint you. Uh, just hang on a second. So in this webinar, I invite you to share my view on working with software risk management. And no, it's not magic. I would rather say it is common sense and it's not about saying spells in forms of various processes. Sure, it is true you can use a development process to reduce the likelihood of software failure. And we will return to this later, but there is more good stuff to learn and understand before we get there. For example, it is essential to understand how to work with probability of occurrence of harm, especially when working with software. Once we've got the probability of occurrence right, we will look at risk control measures in conjunction with software. And lastly, you will also get some ideas about documentation, perhaps not the most enjoyable part, still very important. I'm Christian Kessner, and I started my career as a software developer. I still consider myself as a development guy, but I have developed an interest in quality and regulatory. I've now been in, in the medical device field for more than 20 years. Today, as Carl mentioned, I'm also actively involved in standardization work and joined my first meeting almost 10 years ago. I've been participating in techni as a technical expert in project teams working on IEC 62304 and IEC 82304. And here you see a couple of examples of the project teams working all, actually all around the world. Today, I work as a consultant, but also provide trainings in collaboration with Medical Device HQ. So you can find all our courses at medicaldevicehq.com and you can also find free resources on YouTube. But please don't head over to YouTube now. It's too early. You first, you have to listen to my webinar and the other speakers in this seminar today. Now and then I will try to silence myself and check if there are any questions and comments you would like to share or ask. So in case you have questions, I really encourage you to use the chat. I've seen already that you're pretty good at using the chat. So don't feel shy, ask questions, and I will ask Carl to ask your questions on your behalf. Now, let's start with some theory to get the basics right. Many believe PO should be set to 100% just because you work with software. And please, don't do that. Let's have a look in theory in, in the risk management standard ISO 14971. Risk is defined as the combination of the probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. And before we dive into the details, I want to get you acquainted with two abbreviations I might use. Probability of occurrence of harm is often abbreviated with just PO. Severity is often abbreviated with a single S. The secret of software risk management is hidden in the probability of occurrence of harm. The probability of occurrence of harm is a combination of four factors. The four factors are hazard, sequence of events, hazard situation, and harm. To make this more tangible, I will walk you through an example with help of a bacteria. Bacteria is our hazard, and through poor hand washing, which is the sequence of events, a patient is exposed to the bacteria, which then can cause an infection, which, which then is harm. Software can, generally speaking, not harm people. Software can take you to a hazard situation, and there must, but there wants to be something else acting on behalf of the software to harm people. This is why software risk management is all about identifying how software can contribute to hazardous situations. So to make your software risk management work more understandable, I strongly recommend you to consider splitting PO in two components. The first part, usually called P1, is the likelihood of the hazardous situation occurring, which is the result of the sequence of events that preceded the hazardous situation. In our example, what is the probability that someone forgets to wash their hands or doesn't do it good enough? The next part is the likelihood of harm occurring from a hazardous situation. In our example, what is the probability that the bacteria can make its way from the hands through the needle stick and cause an infection. Combined, P1 and P2 results in the probability of occurrence of harm, 
I, I assume you've heard about the infamous statement that you should almost assume that software fails. This often leads to insane risk management work. And here I can give you a helping hand because this statement refers to P1 and not PO. And consequently, software risk management is about how to reduce the likelihood that the software can contribute to hazardous situations, which is all about reducing P1. Onwards, throughout this webinar, when I talk about software risk management, P1 is what I have in mind. Instead of just talking about theory and different probabilities, let's have a look at the software example and play with the different terms. In this example, we assume that 1% of the population is allergic to drug A, and we have five different drugs to choose from. The software fails by selecting the wrong medication. What is the PO for this risk? The right answer is, it depends. It depends on the type of software failure we're dealing with. Either the software results in randomly selecting one of the five drugs, or the failure always results in choosing drug A. Let's start with the assumption that drug A always gets selected. This will always result in a hazardous situation. But even if the hazardous situation always occurs, there's only 1% likelihood that it will actually harm someone. This is because only 1% of the patient had an issue with drug A. So as you can see now, we're pretty far away from the assumption that PO should be set to 100%. In the random drug example, I still agree that the software failure will happen, but there's no way to predict whether the failure results in drug A or any other drug. So in this particular case, if the hazard situation is drug A, <clears throat> is that drug A is incorrectly chosen, the likelihood of the hazard situation occurs is 20%. And this is quite a difference, right? And again, it is only 1% of the patients which are allergic to drug, and consequently, the likelihood of harm occurring ends up in 0.2%, which is an even bigger difference compared to assuming it always happened. Perhaps you now ask yourself, is this really okay? Well, the first example is without doubt acceptable. The second is in theory correct, but is most likely depending on how the software was designed. So, so this is not a programming webinar, but to understand what I mean with design dependency, I have to show you a few lines of source code. So let's get dirty and dive into the source code. If, if we follow the logic in this example, Drug A should be chosen if selection value is less than five. Unfortunately, we have a lazy programmer who ends this function with a simple else statement. Now assume that the selection value is a byte variable and can take any value between zero and 255. It is a simplification, but in the event of a software failure with this design, the likelihood of ending up with drug A is roughly 250 divided by 255 because any value above five will result in drug A. This is not a flattering number. So let's look at a better example. In this, in this example, drug A has got its own selection row, you see at the end, and all other values will trigger an error. If we again allow ourselves to simplify the statistics and assume that an error state is acceptable, this will lead to a scenario where potential software failure messing up selection value will result in a much lower P1. For both examples, I know I've cut some corners when it comes to statistics, but my point here is to show how the likelihood of software failure depends on the software design. And this is to some extent justifies why we should start with assuming a very high P1, because if you have poor design, you will end up with a higher likelihood of the software failing. I hope this example not only gave you insights about P1 and P2, but also the importance of a good development process with, for example, coding guidelines and peer reviews. So, under, oh, sorry, Carl, do we already have some questions or should I just continue? Uh, no questions so far. I guess the people are still in awe. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's continue then.
So as you probably already imagined, software risk management is often associated, associated with a lot of pain. Usually the com pain comes for three different reasons. The first is lack of understanding in how to manage probability of software failures. And this is what you just learned a little bit about. Secondly, risk assessment templates are usually not tailored to manage software risks. And lastly, something that really can confuse people. And that is the difference between software risk controls and risk controls implemented by software. Now you've learned to deal with these obstacles. So let's start and clear up the confusion about software risk controls and risk controls implemented by software. The wordings are similar, but the meaning is quite different. Risk control is implemented by software. That is when the software is used to reduce the probability of harm for functionality outside of the software itself. For example, the goods coming out from a steam sterilizer are very hot and can cause burns to operators. To minimize the risk of harm, the software can prompt a warning on a user interface. This is a risk control measure, but it's not a software risk control measure. And this is what confused many. The software now implements a functionality which happens to be a risk control measure, but not a software risk control measure. So what is then a software risk control measure? A software risk control measure is used to reduce the likelihood that a failure within the software can contribute to a hazardous situation. If we assume that the steam sterilizer warning is an important one, then we should assess if we can add software risk control or software risk control measures to that functionality. This could, for example, be adding priorities in the software, ensuring that warning will always be displayed on top of other messages. So risk control measures implemented by software are used to reduce risks outside the software, such as the steam sterilizer warning. Software risk control measures, on the other hand, are reducing the likelihood of failures within the software. For example, safeguarding that the warning is appearing on the screen when expected. The scope of software risk management as defined by IEC 62304 is about software risk control in your software. This may sound like a twisted word, but you should distinguish between software risk control and risk controls implemented by software to avoid confusing yourself and others when working with software risk management. Now let's continue with how to manage the probability of software failure and get the terminology right. But first, a quick reminder. Software risk management is all about P1. Now let's explore the tools available to reduce the likelihood of P1. The starting point for a software risk analysis is to assume that we have the worst software ever and it will always contribute to a hazardous situation. The good thing with this negative attitude is that there is a lot of room for improvement and that's of course great. By introducing a software risk control measure, the likelihood of a software failure becomes lower. It may be difficult to estimate how efficient a software risk control measure is. Still, I believe we can agree that doing something is better than doing nothing. And this doing something can be referred to as a relative probability rather, rather than a quantitative probability. And if you haven't heard about this term before, I can recommend the guidance on application of ISO 14971 to medical device software, where you can find this row. Focus primarily on severity and the relative probability of harm if a failure should occur. Now let's get back to what we can do about P1. IEC 62304 heavily refers to software items when talking about software risk management. However, from a general risk management perspective, I rec recommend you looking at three different places when searching for soft software risk control measures. You will now get a brief introduction to all three. First, you can ask yourself, what can you do in your development process to reduce the likelihood of a failure? A well-established process is there to reduce the likelihood of mistakes and failures. A development process based on IEC 62304, class B or C, is a risk control measure on its own. 
But for Class A software, there are no requirements for software risk management, which makes the value of such process, let's say, questionable. So how much can I, <clears throat> sorry, so how much can a development process lower P1? Well, this is for you to justify, but I have no problems with claiming a reduction down to 1% or even more when following a good development process. Secondly, what are your options in the software system level to reduce the likelihood of a software to fail? Simplified, you can say this often relates to architectural design. On a software system level, you can deal with courses which are applicable to several software items and courses. For example, if a risk is related to processes, <clears throat> sorry, for example, if a risk is related to processing speed, then you could define system requirements assuring that you are guaranteed sufficient CPU power. Well, this CPU power would then be a hardware requirement implementing a risk control measure on behalf of the software. And as I mentioned, this relates to architecture design where you find, also find requirements about segregation necessary for risk control. Lastly, what actions can you take on software items? When you're working with risk control measure at software item level, it is often relating to adding functionality to the source code, such as protecting data with checksums. The trickier thing here is that adding more source code also means more things can go wrong. So obviously, spreading software risk control measures all around just because you can does not necessarily have to be a good thing. <clears throat> So sorry, I got a little bit lost here, um, hang on. When working with software risk management, your goal is to reduce the likelihood of failure within the software, and you have several options to achieve this. There's of course nothing holding you back from combining risk control for all three alternatives to further reduce P1. If you combine several risk controls, it is logical to assume that the likelihood of failure will become lower. You're free to multiply as many numbers as you want to, but be careful here. If you multiply many small numbers, you will end up with zero. And we are talking about software, and I believe you agree that zero probability of failure in software is unfortunately not feasible. Now let's see, I'm pausing a little bit, taking a sip of water. Are there any questions, Carl? Yes, there are. Um, right. I think one of the first question relates to your example with the code. And the question is, shouldn't P1 uh, in the better example be a sixth? And maybe you can um, uh, oh, what, explain what why it became... It be... Yeah, I think that in your example, you said that the probability after doing this really smart coding, we land on a probability of 1% instead of a probability of one sixth. It is a 1%. I have to check the slide again. Yeah. Is that perhaps a typo? Oh, sorry, 20%. So that's a fifth. <clears throat> and then they said, why is it a fifth? Maybe it should be a sixth. Maybe I, did, maybe I didn't did the math right. I was thinking that you have one. Yeah, you're probably right. It depends on how you do the math, really. Okay. I was saying so, that you have f five options, yep. and one of, them, one of them is right, and you could end up with other four, and that would be fail. So that's why I ended up with one fifth in what is that one sixth. But we could argue about the numbers. I, I, I give you that. No, no, yeah, no problem. I, I'll consider um, it one nil to the world against Christian Kessner. Here comes the next question. Can extra testing be considered as a software risk control measure? And this is something I ask myself every now and then. If I add more tests to the same function, will that reduce the risk? Uh, good question indeed. Um, I usually tend to say that uh, testing is not a good risk control measure. Because how do you know that you have tested enough? I, I definitely prefer to say, do something in the design and aim for that. Because testing to me just confirms your design. It's really not reducing the risk. 
it might increase the likelihood that you find errors, but as a risk control measure, I'm, I'm not, I don't fancy testing as a risk control measure. Yeah, that was that's, a clear answer. View. Yeah. That's, that's my view. And I know there are different views out there. So many people say risk control verification is a risk control measure, but I, I really don't think there's any way to estimate how judge if the verification is good enough. Yeah. So to me, design and a good process is by far much better. And verification does include, is included in the, in the process, of course. Yes. I the see. design is to me king. Yes. Is it, is it implicitly assumed that a hardware risk control measure always outweigh a software risk control measure? That was a good one. Um, as a software guy, I would say no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That was a short one. <laughs> no, well, All right. I, I think I think to be fair, we have software as medical devices, and there are not many options there to use hardware risk control measures. So you need to trust software risk control measures as well. And in many cases, uh, I think software risk control measures could be a really, really good choice. It could be quicker, faster, and easier to implement than hardware risk control measures. So I think yep. it's oh, it's really hard to tell. But given we have software-only products, I would say software risk control measures must be trustworthy as well. So, very good. So there is another question here. Well, I'll, I will save it for later because it's a bit longer than the other ones. All right. Then I continue then. So you already know that software can contribute to hazard situation in various ways. This section now is about how to think about software risk control measures. The first thing I want to bring up is to manage expectations when talking about risk control measures in general. As we just talked about software and hardware risk control measures, some are effective, some are not. And then you have risk control measures which are dependent on who is receiving the information. For example, I would stop at this sign, but I have friends who would read this sign as an exciting information just enter the slope. And we surely think different. The effectiveness of a risk control measure is often dependent on the context. And I will say this, this also applies very much to software risk control measures. For example, a checksum is often considered as a solid risk control measure to protect and validate important data. But sometimes a checksum is providing false safety, and I will later tell you why. So unfortunately, you cannot define a toolbox of software risk control measures. You must assess the appropriateness for every single situation. And here we come back again to the software versus hardware control risk control measure. It's really case dependent. In the risk management standard ISO 14971, this is called risk control option analysis. When working with software, we can use the same logic as listed in the risk management standard, but we must of course exclude manufacturing because manufacturing is not part of software. We have, to, we have the following three alternatives, inherently safe design, protective measures in the medical device itself, and information for safety and where appropriate training to users. They sound reasonable when you read them, but they have their own challenges. So first, a few general words. When considering your options for software risk controls, you should start with defining a safe state for your medical device. A safe state is a state in which the device cannot harm or cause any harm, or at least as little harm as possible. Finding a safe state can be a true challenge, especially if you're working with a standalone software. So why should you bother about it? Because there will be situations when a software failure is detected and you need to know what to do. Often you don't know why the error happened and therefore have no clue what else might have gone wrong prior to detecting the failure. In such case, the best you can do is to aim for a safe state and safely shut down the software as quick as you can before it gets even worse. I would not say safe state is a risk control measure in itself. And some might argue, even argue and say, well, this is not value adding and it's definitely not required by any standards or regulations. But trust me, when working with software, there will be scenarios where 
the implementer risk control measures identify something went wrong and you need to know what to do. And this is what I call the safe state. Therefore, I urge you to consider what is your safe state in your software. Now let's have a look at the options for software risk control measures before there is a need to head and run for the safe state. The easiest way to work with safe design in software is to reduce functionality. Another, another way to putting it, keep the software clean and simple. The more features you add, the more line of codes can go wrong. And ironically, as I mentioned before, this applies also to software risk control measures. The more you add, the more can go wrong. However, if you decide to not implement functionality because of risk considerations, please make sure to document this in your risk analysis to avoid future surprises. Because if you, if you avoid implementing things and later when we have functional growth, things will be added again, and then perhaps risk will be reintroduced in your product. Reducing functionality is fine, but it doesn't make sense to have a software without functionality just to make it, make it safe, right? So this is where you can work with protective measures in your software development work. When working with protective measures in software, you should consider two approaches. The first and most efficient is to prevent failure causing uh, for the causes entering into the system. The second alternative is to work with risk control measures inside the software. Unfortunately, the second alternative is often related to detecting failure occurring rather than preventing. But in many cases, detection of a failure suffices to avoid a hazardous situation occurring. Let's look at a few examples. A very good way to prevent hazard situation occurring in the software is to validate data entering the system. This allows you to reject bad data before it enters the software and can cause trouble. Data validation, <clears throat> so data validation is valuable for both user entries to check, uh, sorry. Data validation is valuable both for user entries and to check data origin from other technical systems. So you have both user entries and perhaps system commun communicating with each other. A software risk control measure for data validation could be called rain check, but it can also be cross-checking between various parameters entered into the system. Another software risk control measure is to manage what interfaces should be made available and also when and how they can be used. Interfaces can be Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, USB, or any other communication interface, but it can also be user interfaces. For example, if you have an advanced graphical user interface, there's no point in allowing users playing around and fiddling with device configuration settings while a critical treatment is taking place. In such case, I would only allow access to functionality strictly needed for the treatment and perhaps also shut down external interfaces. Because by reducing the functionality, there are few things that can go wrong, which makes it easier to keep the software safe during the critical treatment. And as a bonus, your verification will be less complicated with fewer combinations to test. So at least in theory, you get a safer software and less work for you. My last example for preventing software courses entering the software system is to use access control. Access control can be combined with other risk control measures and applied to both human and technical user access. Access control is generally a good thing, but be mindful about when to use it. For example, I doubt a caregiver would be too impressed if prompted for a password in an emergency situation. This is a typical example where a risk control measure might be good for some situations, but could contribute to new risks in other situations. And this field is also where you often find a conflict, conflict between security risk assessment and safety risk assessments. We have just been talking about protective measures, which means preventing software causes from entering the software system. Unfortunately, things can also go wrong inside the software without the help from the outside. Let's move inside the software system. <clears throat> 
Here are three examples which may be suitable for internal risk control measures. For this webinar, we will take a closer look at data integrity. A very common, and I would say good risk control measure is to use checksums. You could say that the checksum act as a protection layer around the data you want to safeguard. The purpose of checksum is to detect if your precious data, such as patient information, has been compromised, and it could look like this. A bug is incorrectly writing to your precious data, the data gets corrupted, but when this happens, the checksum calculation will fail. So this risk control measure is not really preventing loss of data, but it might prevent bad things from happening because you can detect that your precious data has been damaged. But I really want you to be careful with trusting checksums too much because the effectiveness of a checksum might be worthless from a safety perspective if the detection comes too late. Let's assume your software is taking care of a life critical situation. There's not much value in having a checksum detecting that your data has been compromised and the system needs to shut down. In such case, also a checksum may result in a blue screen of death, and in this case, you might kill the patient. And killing patients is not a fun story, right? And as for all other risk management work, if you can't do anything actively in the design, you can at least inform and train the user. The advantage of working with software is that you often can force users to see information on screen and ask them to press you know, an OK button. I have read, I have confirmed. Unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, there's still no way for software to force the user to actually read the information displayed to them. So in terms of risk control measures, information is useful, but it is better to actively do something in the design. There's of course a lot more to say about software risk control measures, but for this webinar, I have, have to save time for the enjoyable documentation part as well. So let's head over to documentation. Perhaps you ask yourself how to work with this in a hazard trace traceability matrix, often re referred to as HTM. Let's have a look at how it can be integrated into a hazard traceability matrix. A typical HDM includes the following elements. Hazard, reasonable foreseeable sequences or combination of events, hazard situation, harm, probability of occurrence, which is PO, severity, and the conclusion whether the risk is acceptable or not. But when working with software, we shouldn't be too happy about only finding PO in the matrix. As you probably already know, at least I, I want more. If you work a lot with software, you should expand the matrix to also include P1 and P2. PO can then be based on the combination of P1 and P2. You can choose if you want to use this approach only for software-related risks, but there's certainly no harm in using this approach to all your risk management work. Perhaps it's me just getting old, but I often struggle to remember the rationale behind the numbers. When this happened, Comments are invaluable. Comments do not need to appear in the form of documentation and can be hidden. If you're working in Excel, for example, you can easily hide the comments in the formal version of your documentation, but it's a good, good place to keep them and they can be really, really valuable when you get questioned and you need to remember what happened and how did we discuss. I've now shown you to expand the risk analysis section of an HDM. The same logic applies to the risk control section. You simply just add two more columns to include P1 and P2. I will now walk you through a made-up example and show how or what the HDM could look like when implementing P1 and P2. The example is about a software controlling an air pump, which is used to help patients breathe. So you can say, in other words, it's a type of ventilator. The software control parameters get corrupted and cause the pump to run at high speed. This results in hazard situations where the lungs can be exposed to high air pressure and potential results in serious injury. We assume that the software failure always happens, and that is P1 equals 1. And since it's just an example, P2 has been given a random number. <laughs> 
Based on the multiplication of P1 and P2, you can now calculate PO and convert it into a semi-quantitative quantitative number, which is commonly used for PO. I will now switch to the other side of the HDM, and you will be co confronted with a lot of text, but stay with me and focus on the big picture. In the risk control part of the HDM, you find risk control option analysis, risk control measures, verification of effect effectiveness, and if risk control measures are implemented. And lastly, we have P1 and P2. As you can see, it looks the same as it did in the risk analysis section, but now P1 has got a lower number. The reduction of P1 is a result of risk control measures implemented. If you want to aim for perfection, you could assign a risk reduction number to each risk control measure and, and combine them into a single P1. However, it quickly becomes complicated and you might end up in endless discussion about numbers instead of focusing on the big picture, which is designing a safe product. So here I recommend you using common sense and evaluate the combination of available risk control measures and assign a meaningful number to P1. And with a meaningful number, I mean, of course, a relative probability. So you lower P1 compared to being 100%, you lower it to something that's relative. The risk control measures you have added lowers P1 to something that's, that's reasonable. I hope this example with the HDM inspired you to explore your options to use P1 and P2 in your documentation and explore how it can help you to make your software risk management work more meaningful. We are now reaching the end of my time slot in this webinar, uh, but first let's do a short recap. If you don't already use P1 and P2, I mean, wh what are you waiting for? It makes soft risk management so much easier to work with and understand, since you don't need to assume that PO is always 100%. There is a better way, so please try to explore and use P1 and P2 in your software risk management. And don't try too hard with calculating software probability. Instead, do something and use your good judgment to estimate reasonable relative numbers. And lastly, explore all possible risk control options you find in the development process, in software, on the software system, and in your software items. Now, make sure you don't forget to subscribe to our free content on YouTube. And if you want to connect with us, we are on LinkedIn too. Just find us at Medical Device HQ. And lastly, if you want to connect with me, you find me at LinkedIn, Christian Kessner. That's all for me. Thank you so much for hanging in there in this webinar uh, about software risk management. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot.